Well, thank you, John, uh, for that introduction. And uh, I want to thank the department and faculty and students for inviting me to be part of this lecture series. I never had the opportunity to meet Dr. Ricciuti, but I know of his, um, uh, some of his work. And I'm very impressed and very flattered that I would be invited to give a talk at a series that is sponsored by somebody who was so beloved by the department. I haven't met anybody here yet who's had anything but praise and, and uh, admiration for uh, Dr. Ricciuti. So I'm very, very pleased to be here to be part of this series and very pleased to be invited along with the other folks who've come and given talks. It's a very, uh, a very um, good, very outstanding group of scholars who you've invited and who've come to talk about their work. So today, a lot, uh, some of you may be familiar with the work that I've done on family stress processes and how family stress processes influence uh, parenting and, and child outcomes. Today, I'm going to go in a little bit different direction. I'm actually going to talk about how advantages, social and economic advantages, actually promote competent development, particularly in terms of the development of conscientiousness. Now, I don't cite a lot of papers. Actually, I don't know if I cite any papers in the PowerPoint slides. But a good place for people to start if they're interested in the issue of conscientiousness is a June 2014 special section in developmental psychology. Well, there's a series of wonderful papers in that, um, uh, in that special section on what we know about conscientiousness, how it's de defined and measured, and uh, what some of the uh, empirical findings are. There are also some really interesting theoretical papers. And um, it's interesting. Uh, in particular, there's a theoretical paper by uh, Conti and Heckman, which uh, is, a, is a great pap a paper for th those of us in the social sciences to read, because it's absolutely elegant in terms of the theory and his suggestions for the uh, testing of theory. We do a little bit of what uh, Conti and Heckman talked about in that article in this paper, uh, or in this uh, talk, and in a paper that I've developed that uh, goes with this talk. Um, and his ideas fit very well with a model that I'll be talking about that we developed a few years back. So the, the impetus for this kind of work really comes from the fact that, that there's been a lot of interest in the economy in recent years, given the economic downturn, the recession, of, uh, of 2008, uh, the slow recovery that we've experienced since the recession occurred, problems of income inequality, and just a, a big focus and interest for policymakers about economic circumstances of families. There's also a lot of interest in this, what I call the stickiness of social and economic circumstances across generations. If you're born poor, there's a very high probability that you will grow up to be poor and that your children will be poor. If you're born well-to-do, there's a very high probability that your children will grow up to be well-to-do and that uh, th that will continue across generations. There's also increasing interest in the pathways through which SES and human development are interrelated. We know that, that socioeconomic status is related to lots of characteristics of human beings, uh, both physical health and emotional health and so on. But we don't uh, always have a good understanding of why that is the case. But in this particular talk, I'm going to be especially focused on this notion of stickiness. Why is it that there's cumulative advantages across time in some families and cumulative disadvantage in other families? And in thinking about the issue and in reading that special section in developmental psychology, uh, it occurred to me that conscientiousness may play a key role in why it is that in particularly in more well-to-do families, uh, that, uh, that advantage uh, continues from one generation to, an, to another. Uh, the importance of conscientiousness. Conscious, conscientious people uh, tend to work hard. They demonstrate self-control, set goals. They persevere in... Uh, uh, in uh, response to challenges, they tend to be responsible. Uh, and it turns out that people with those kinds of characteristics uh, appear to do better economically, socially, and emotionally than people without those characteristics. They also tend to uh, live longer. They, they uh, are, are healthier, so much healthier, that they experience lower rates of mortality. 
So the question that I ask in this particular uh, paper, in this particular talk, is whether or not conscientiousness helps to account for the cumulative advantage or disadvantage that people experience as a result of the economic circumstances into which they are born, economic and social circumstances. <clears throat> By the way, how long is this talk supposed to go on? It's uh, scheduled for an hour. Okay. Okay, great, for an hour. Okay, good. Because I could go from 15 minutes to three hours, so <laughs> I'll, do the, I'll do the one hour version. <laughs> well, if we're going to understand something about conscientiousness and how it has these good effects, uh, it's important to understand where it comes from. How is it that some people are more conscientious than other people? <clears throat> and, it, uh, and it turns out that, that uh, self-regulation and self-control are central aspects of conscientiousness the ability to focus attention, to change attention as needed by the demands of the situation, uh, and so on. The, the ability to control one's emotions appropriately in response to stress, and so on. And so self-regulation and self-control <clears throat> are central aspects of conscientiousness. And it turns out that there's evidence that positive parenting characteristics, warmth and support from parents, seems to be associated in younger children with greater self-control. So Eisenberg and her uh, colleagues have uh, suggested that parenting may play an important role in the development of conscientiousness through its impact on, uh, on self-regulation earlier in life. Uh, that's the wrong direction. Excuse me. Uh, <coughs> I thought I was hitting the, the laser pointer. Still not there. So if it's the case that, and there is evidence that positive parenting predicts greater self-control, uh, <clears throat> that raises the, co the question of the context of parenting. If better parenting increases the prob probability that a person will grow up to be a, a, a conscientious or, or more self-controlled individual, <clears throat> where did that parenting come from? And that takes us all the way back to SES. Could it be that SES affects the types of parenting that influence self-control and eventually personality development? <coughs> so that's, the, that's the, uh, the starting place for this paper. Well, in economics, there's something called the investment model, or, the, or what we've called the family investment model. <coughs> and it's one way to think about <coughs> how SES might influence what parents do in terms of their children. Now, in economics, of course, they're thinking primarily about differences in income. So family income is associated with a range of investments, <clears throat> including living in better neighborhoods. If I have more money, I can live in a better neighborhood. <clears throat> better housing, more adequate medical care, better nutrition, educational opportunities, and so on. If my child needs tutoring, I can afford to buy them tutoring. I can get a tutor for them, and so on. And we know from earlier research that these kinds of investments lead to increased human capital, child competence, greater social and economic success. We don't know exactly from the economics literature how that occurs. That's the black box from economics. <clears throat> and in particular, the, the investment model does not specifically address the role of personality and its consequences. But a few years ago, a colleague of mine and I, Brent Donlan and I, <clears throat> came up with a model that we called the interactionist perspective, drawing on uh, Magnuson's idea of, of uh, interactionist theory. <clears throat> and what we've done is we've examined family SES, parental investments, and personality development as part of a dynamic process where one influences the other across time. And it's consistent with Magnuson's idea of an interactionist theory with Samaroff's uh, transactional approach to child development and so on. And when <clears throat> conscientiousness is the personality attribute of interest, as you'll see in this paper, I think it suggests one of the mechanisms whereby you get this process of cumulative advantage across time and across generations. <clears throat> so here's the, here's the first model that I'm going to look at today in this, uh, in this talk. And in, we know from a lot of studies that education 
Uh, and I'm going to be drawing on the Iowa study, the Family Transitions Project. And I started in 1991 when the, uh, when the adolescents in the Family Transitions Project were <clears throat> about 15, 14, 15 years old. And we know from earlier research that education influences, has a fairly robust influence in a number of studies on parenting investments in terms of things like support, consistent discipline, uh, uh, warmth, uh, involvement, and so on. And we know that income from the investment literature, from the e economic model on investments, we know that income is associated with the material invest, the kinds of material investments that I talked about. <clears throat> we would call these pathways uh, a s part of the uh, social causation process. So, so we know that that the um, um, that that, we, that these these social cause, causation pathways do exist. That that we see these kinds of relationships between education, income, and investments. Now, in this particular study, some people. Uh, have taken education and income, and they'll use them as indicators of a single SES, socioeconomic status construct. But, but in reality, what happens in contemporary society anyway, is that education typically is the forerunner of one's eventual income. People with greater education do better in terms of their, their income. It's part of what your university president says when she goes to the, to the, the legislature and asks for, for more money. People are going to do better economically, and we're going to have a more robust economic system if people have more education, better education. And the nice part about it, when she says it, is it's actually true. So as one so sociologist said, education is the canonical variant in terms of SES. So <clears throat> in this particular study, these uh, education reported by the parents the original G1, the first generation parents in this study, uh, that occurred uh, typically about, it was completed about 15 to 20 years before 1991. In other words, their total years of education had occurred quite a few years before, and we said that it would predict their income in the past year. So we separate education and income for two different reasons. One, we think that based on previous research, it, <clears throat> education will have a bigger impact <clears throat> on investments involving more effective parenting practices. Income will have a bigger impact on material investments, the things you can afford to give your child in a, in a material sense, like living in a better neighborhood and so on. But the important point is that we predicted in this, in this interactionist model, we predicted that both kinds of parenting investments would predict adolescent conscientiousness. So this, uh, we measured conscientiousness in 1994 when these adolescents were uh, about 18 years old, last year of high school. So all of this is part of the typical social causation process. And notice we're not looking at family stress now. We're really looking at family advantage. Higher SES in the form of education and income will influence parenting investments expected to increase the development of self-control and similar kinds of characteristics of conscientiousness. So for Eisenberg and her colleagues, they argue that self-control is, the primary, uh, is, the, is the, the primary aspect of conscientiousness that's really important. We have earlier studies showing that parenting investments increase self-control. So we simply extrapolate and say, that uh, these kinds of investments are going to increase self-control and conscientiousness in general. So that's the social causation aspect of the interactionist model. Now, <clears throat> what makes it more interesting is that these characteristics, these positive uh, characteristics in terms of conscientiousness, are then expected to increase the likelihood that this adolescent is going to do well when they become a, an adult this would be at age 25, this is at age 18, uh, they're going to do better in terms of completed years of education, they're going to do better in terms of the income that they will earn. And that that will feed back, now that would be called a social selection process. So now we've got social causation, social selection, and then social causation again, because we expect 
that these good things that are more likely to occur based on these uh, personality advantages associated with earlier SES <clears throat> uh, will create more good things in terms of environment, the SES environment, and that will feed back to increase conscientiousness across time. So the actual success that the individual has based on these kinds of conscientious characteristics should increase their level of conscientiousness over time. It's kind of like if you think about a kid in school, if you give them successes, then, then they over time come to believe that they can be more successful. And so you're reinforcing their, their beliefs and their values about success in school. So that's the first part of the model that I'm going to look at uh, today. Then the, the next part of the model that I'm going to look at in the second hour no, uh, <coughs> is we're going to look at the next generation of kids. We're going to look at G3. Now notice that this part of this model is exactly what, I, what we had over here. So in adolescence, well, education and income of the parents influence their parenting behaviors and influence the development of conscientiousness by the adolescent. Now we ask the same thing. These, uh, these kids that we followed for some 20 years, they've grown up and had children of their own, and that's the third generation, G3. And we ask exactly the same question. Will we replicate what we find with the G1 and G2 generation during adolescence? will re replicate it when we go out to this third generation child. And these kids averaged about 10 years of age uh, in this study. And I'll explain that more later. But G2 education, influencing their income, um, in, in, uh, influencing the kinds of parenting investments they make in their child. And will that influence G3's development of conscientiousness? Now we have some important advantages here. <clears throat> now we can control for parent conscientiousness before they became a parent. So before they could be influenced by the child's characteristics. So this is when they're 18 years old. And out here, they're in their early 30s, uh, the G2s. Uh, and the G3s are about 10 years old. Now we can control. You know, if this is entirely a genetic phenomenon, there should none of these... None of these social factors, these social causation factors, should play any role whatsoever. It should just be, you've got, an you've got a conscientious parent, you're going to have a conscientious child. So we can test to see to what degree this might be a genetic connection. <clears throat> we can also test to see whether or not the influence of education and income on these parenting investments, is it because of education or income? Or is it simply because of the parenting investments that G2 experiences as a child? We know that kids tend to parent like their parents to some degree. So maybe, maybe this, this link from conscientiousness to education down to parenting investments, maybe none of that actually makes a bit of difference. Maybe it's just you had good parents, you're going to be a good parent. And that's the whole story. And all this other mumbo jumbo doesn't really make any, any difference. So, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to test those two models in this, particular, um, in this particular set of analyses. There's supposed to be a slide here that says, I'm going to test those two models. <laughs> but I think that slide comes later where it was supposed to come right here. So anyway, you know I'm going to test those two models. And I'm going to use it, I'm going to test them using data from the Family Transitions Project. Now let me give you a little bit more information about the project itself. <clears throat> in 1989, we started the Family Transitions Project in rural Iowa. And it developed, uh, it developed out of the economic downturn in agriculture in the, in the upper Midwest. The downturn was absolutely dramatic uh, during the 1980s. Uh, every week, I was at Iowa State University at that time, and every week in the newspapers, you'd, you'd read about farmers uh, being thrown off the land. Every, every county, and there are 99 counties in Iowa, there are small counties. Every county, in every county courthouse, every, every week they would put up white crosses in the courthouse lawns 
in the various counties to show how many farms had been thrown out of business, had been uh, taken back by the bank in those counties in any given week. And those crosses were really building up. You'd read about farmers shooting themselves because they, they went bankrupt. You'd read about bankers shooting themselves because they could no longer stand to foreclose on all these farmers. What people often from the outside often don't realize is the farmers and the bankers, the, the farmer and the banker probably grew up together. They probably went to the same schools. They maybe married one another's sisters. Uh, they, uh, they knew each other well. And now the fabric of their existence was being entirely torn apart. So this guy that I've known for 35 years and has been my friend, and we do all kinds of things together, I've got to go tell him that I'm not going to give him the money he needs to continue to operate his farm this next week or this next year. I've got to do that to my old friend. And for some of the bankers, they couldn't stand it. And for some of the farmers, they couldn't stand it either. And it was a really terrible and tragic time. Well, we convinced NIMH back then that we should really study this and, and study how these families were coping with this degree of disturbance in their lives. So they gave us the money. It was very interesting, actually. A group from NIMH came out, and we showed them some videos of some of these families talking about their experiences. And of course, we had to, we had to mask the screens because we couldn't reveal the identity of any families. And these were just sort of pretest families. And these, actually, two or three, four administrators from NIMH, they want to know if this was really important because all they could think about when they thought about Iowa was these pristine farms with roses and nice fences and well-painted silos and so on. We played some of these tapes and taught these people talking about their experiences. We got through the first couple ta tapes, and, uh, and these guys said, that's it. We don't need to see any more. We understand now how bad the situation is. So, and they gave us the money. So, in 1989, we launched this study with, uh, and, and the, the adolescent portion of the study lasted in 1989 from seventh grade to 12th grade uh, in 1994. There were a total of 556 adolescents. There were originally 400 and some in two-parent families, and then we added a supplementary sa sample of single-parent families to diversify the, the, uh, the sample. But we started, so we had a total of 556 of these Generation two adolescents, uh, all in rural Iowa. And then in 1995, once they completed high school in 94, we continued to follow the, G, the original G2 cohort of adolescents as they moved into adulthood. And uh, we followed through, most of them through several romantic partners, but almost all of them <clears throat> were married by their mid to late 20s. And many of them had had a child, the G3 child in the study. So we also studied the, the children uh, of the children. Uh, we, so the G2s were followed from an average of 12 years of age to 34 years old by 2010. And that's where I only do analyses with data out to 2010. We've collected some data since then. But over a 20-year period, we had 91% retention. Now, there's a couple tees, uh, keys to the retention. One is you need to make them feel like it's their study, not your study. Another thing, and probably more important, is you need to pay them. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, and that helps. But these retention figures in these kinds of longitudinal studies are a little bit misleading because people typically don't drop out completely. If you're going out, let's say, for part, during adolescence we went out every year, during adulthood we've gone out every other year, they, do, they really don't drop, most of them never drop out completely. They might miss a year or they might miss a, a, a couple of years in the series. But if we just looked at how many people who were originally in the study at some time re, uh, came back into the study, it would be more like 95%. So the retention figures are, are actually a little bit higher. There's a total of 350 G3 children back in 2010 from age 2 to age 17. So quite a number of G3 children. Now in the present analyses, uh, I, I look at data from 1991, a mean age when the kids were 14 years. I think that's really more like 
I think that's really more like 15, but it's, it's 14 to 15 out to 2010, thir between 33 and 34. Uh, now, for the G1 parents and G2 cohort members back when they were adolescents, 19% of the G1 parents were single parents, a single mother household. And almost always it was a single mother household. Um, we focus on the G2 adults with a romantic partner, and that was 347. Now, it's, it's between 80 and 90% of them had a romantic partner at any given wave of data collection. So it's by far the majority had a romantic partner, and most of them were married. Um, and we focus on those folks because we want to get inf an informant report of personality. Most personality studies, you give somebody an obscenely long uh, instrument of 300 to 700,000 items and that they fill out, and from that you assess their personality. Um, but there is some data to suggest that if you get an, a, 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 an assessment of personality by someone who knows the person well, rather than from the, the, the focal individual themselves, you actually get better information in terms of predicting to other life outcomes. So if I, and in our own data, we know that if I ask mom and dad when the G2 adolescent was in 12th grade, if I ask mom and dad about their personality characteristics, those mom and dad reports predict much better to later life circumstances in terms of education, income, even, even a romantic relationship quality than self-reports. Uh, so, and there, there's, there are other studies that show the same kind of phenomenon, that, that if you're predicting the future life outcomes, an, an informant report by someone who knows the person well <clears throat> actually predicts better has better predictive validity than a self-report. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's kind of like videotapes. You never see yourself on a videotape the same way somebody else would see you. And sometimes we just don't see ourselves as clearly as other people see us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then G3 is following the same uh, idea. G3 personality was assessed, uh, in terms of conscientiousness, was assessed in 2007 and in 2010 and for, uh, by reports from the G2s and from their romantic partners. And there we have an N of 282 that had that information. We didn't start assessing personality with the G3s until they were six years old, because we thought that was the, the earliest age at which we could get anything that would look like uh, reasonable data. And, and the 12% of the, G, the families in which the G3 kids lived were single parent families. Uh, measures education for G1, years of com completed schooling by 1991, G2 education. There we looked at, uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, markers of, of uh, educational completion. So one would be less than high school, all the way out to six, a professional degree or a PhD. <clears throat> G1 and G2 income were measured by income to needs ratio. That's total family income divided by the poverty level for a family of that size. In the economics literature, I think this is the preferred index. Actually, if you, if you estimate per capita income, which is just the total income divided by the total number of people in the family, it correlates about 0.9 to 0.95 with income to needs ratio. And it's a whole lot easier to compute. Uh, G1 and G2 parenting investments. The, those were based on observed positive and negative parenting in the family. And uh, for that, we did uh, videotaped interactions between family members. And based on those, uh, those uh, videotapes in the home, all of our data, by the way, were collected in the home. We go out to the homes of the families. Um, <clears throat> we, um, uh, we did videos of them discussing things. And then we rated those videos back at the lab uh, for positive and negative aspects of positive and negative parenting. Uh, low hostility, high warmth and support, consistent uh, uh, managerial practices. The material investments index, and I can give you more information about this if we have time and there's interest. Uh, we use material investments involving, you know, does the home have, uh, is it a, seem like a good learning environment? Is it structurally sound? Is it, what's the neighborhood like? Um, and so on. Things that say 
that the parents are making material investments in the welfare of their child. Conscientiousness, again, we used other report, informant report, because of the demonstrated <coughs> uh, improvement in predictive power. We used the multidimensional personality questionnaire, uh, Telegon's questionnaire. Uh, in 1994, we used that questionnaire uh, to get a parent report of the, on the subscale, the achievement subscale, and the control subscale. Achievement subscale says, uh, I'm ambitious and I want to get ahead, basically. The control subscale says I'm able to plan, I'm able to um, uh, focus my attention on the things that I want to accomplish. I set goals and so on. So we used the Telegon version there and the, and the parent report in 94. People hated it. They just hated completing it because it's a series of vignettes and you have to rate against the vignette. And <clears throat> so our interviewers came back and they said they hated it. And so what we did, and and if I had to do it again, I wouldn't. Uh, it was foolish. Uh, but it, as you'll see, it worked out OK. We took the, the vignette-based telegant measure, turned it into a closed-ended um, uh, questionnaire more suitable for survey research, and, and developed what, was called, what we call the Iowa Personality Questionnaire, which is just a variant of the MPQ and has the same achievement and control subscales. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so in 2005, when G2 was about 27 years old, uh, the romantic partner reported on, on, uh, on G2's achievement and control. And then in 2007 and 2010, a G2 and romantic partner, if there was a romantic partner in the home, uh, completed the same reports on G3 uh, uh, achievement and control. Now, <clears throat> using the same things used with G2 in 2005. Now, keep in mind that these G3s are coming into the study each year once they hit the age at which we take them into the study, uh, 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 a minimum of 18 months of age. And so in 2007, we could have G3s who anywhere from two years old to up to about 17 years old. So the, the two, three, four, five-year-olds we're not getting the personality measure from them. We don't get that until they're, uh, until they're six. Uh, so that's why we, have a, uh, we don't have a full 350 G3s with the personality measure for these analyses. <clears throat> ah, there we go, study result. OK, so the first set of analyses focus on the period of adolescence and predictions the G2 adult conscientiousness. And then the second set of analyses focus on predictions to G3 conscientiousness. Are there, are there any questions so far about measures or study or? OK. So just to remind you, here's the model. Now you'll notice that the model also includes, uh, you know, I said we're basically we're predicting that, that education will lead to parenting investments, will lead to conscientiousness, and that'll lead to greater education. But notice that we, we also have this direct path. And the direct path is there because we know that, that, uh, that there's a strong relationship between parent and child education. Uh, and there could be a lot of other factors that are influencing that, you know, like, like relatives who also are highly educated and are influencing the child. We know also that there's a robust association between income across generations. So we leave that path in. These are kind of the structural pr parameters, sort of the where you are in the society in lots of different ways influences what you become in addition to what's going on in the family. So these are kind of the extra familial structural uh, <clears throat> parameters that may be influencing what's happening to these kids. So here's the, the standardized factor loadings uh, for the various measures uh, um, based on a confirmatory factor analysis for model one, the model from adolescent to adult conscientiousness. And <clears throat> all of the factor loadings, the, the factor loadings of one are for those variables where it's just a manifest variable, one variable uh, estimating the construct. The others are the factor loadings for the, the individual indicators for latent constructs like parenting investments. All of the factor loadings were positive. 
uh, all were statistically significant and in the expected direction. So, you know, some, you know, I've heard statisticians say, well, that's unacceptable. 0.55 to 0.59 would be too low. Uh, you know, unless it's above 0.8, I don't care about it. I've heard others argue, Nessel Road, for example, wrote a wonderful paper one time where he said, you don't want them to be real high because if they're real high, you might as well just put them all together into a single measure. So, uh, so optimistically, you say, well, I'm tapping different dimensions of parenting investments. But I'll let the statisticians worry about that. They're significant in the right direction. So here's the correlations for model one. And you'll notice a couple of things um, <clears throat> right away. Notice that G2 adolescent conscientiousness, all these correlations, by the way, are statistically significant. G2 adolescent conscientiousness, 1994, 18 years old, all of the predictors up to that point uh, significantly predict, at a zero order level, significantly predict G2 adolescent conscientiousness. G1 income predicts adolescent conscientiousness. G2 education, G1 education predicts adolescent conscientiousness. And uh, uh, material and parenting investments predict adolescent conscientiousness. So now the question is going to be, is it really the case that these direct effects of SES, income and education, go away and those effects are explained by the parenting investments in the model? Notice also G2 adult conscientiousness is significantly related to all of the prior variables in the model. <clears throat> all the way back to G1 income, all the way back to G1 education, still showing effects of material investments, still showing effects of parenting investments. Now, if the mediational aspects of the model are correct, those direct effects should go away. And, and these impacts should be mediated through the other elements in the model. And here we go. So, <clears throat> a nice predictive path. These are all standardized regression coefficients. The model fit reasonably well. Education predicts parenting investments, 0.50, as we predicted that it would. But it also predicts material investments, interestingly enough. And it predicts G1 income, as we expected. <clears throat> income predicts material investments, as we thought it would. But it also predicts parenting investments. Now, investment theory wouldn't necessarily predict that. Investment theory predicts, you know, it's going to influence how the family can invest materially in the child. There's nothing in investment theory by itself that says it's going to predict these other kinds of warmth, support, consistency, and management, but it does. There's a whole, I will, you know, I think there's a, there are lots of ways to explain these effects, but for the purposes, for our purposes today, the important thing is that SES does predict, education predicts slightly better than, <clears throat> than income. <clears throat> Both parenting investments and material investments predict adolescent conscientiousness, as we expected. And adolescent conscientiousness predicts well to G2 education. And G2 adolescent conscientiousness predicts well to G2 uh, income some, how long is that? That's six, nine, nine years later. So this is personality at 18 predicting education and income nine years later. So, so pretty good. So pretty good. However, notice education still predicts to education, G1 education to G2 education. But this, the magnitude of the association is about half what it was as a zero order correlation. So the, the, the mediational aspect of the model is, is supported in the sense that it really drops the direct connection between G1 education and G2 education. <clears throat> also interesting, <clears throat> emotional support, good parenting practices also have a direct impact on educational success, even above and beyond these individual differences. 
So we're still getting, we're still getting these social effects, still getting these social effects in addition to the di individual difference effect. Both of them are proving to be important. Now income drops out. There's no longer a direct path to income. So all of the direct path, the zero order association between G1 income and G2 income is accounted for by the influence or the association of income with both types of parenting investments and with adolescent conscientiousness. Interestingly, material investments also predict to direct, directly to G2 income. You know, and I don't know how to explain that, to tell you the truth, other than you know, maybe you get used to having a little bit better standard of living and you aspire to maintain a little bit better standard of living, excuse me, once you get older. So, but I, I would not have predicted that, and I don't know uh, exactly how to explain it. <clears throat> G2 education, uh, now this, most of them had completed their years of education by 21, 22, something like that. Uh, and this is at age 25. So their earlier, for the most part, earlier educational accomplishments uh, predict to their income, and both income and education predict relative increases in conscientiousness over time. So, <clears throat> so we're getting this selection effect. Kids with certain kinds of characteristics do better, and doing better increases the magnitude of those individual differences. Now notice there's no direct effect from adolescent conscientiousness to adult conscientiousness. Not a temperament. Pardon me? Not a stable temperament. Well, there's not one single personality theorist in the world who would agree with that conclusion. I know. Yeah. And it may be, it may be that, that we have been so conservative in our measurement. Notice now, this is adolescent conscientiousness assessed by the G1 parents, predicting to adult conscientiousness of the same person uh, estimated by a romantic partner. Now, the zero order association between these two things was 0.27, but it goes completely away. Um, uh, I suspect if we had used, if we'd used self reports of G2 in both places, we probably would still have a significant relationship. The zero order association for self-reports is probably about 0.4, something like that. But, um, but it, it's, it's an interesting thought. Is it the case that using just self-reports by a single individual overestimates the degree of stability, uh, simply because dispositional characteristics lead you to think about yourself and the world in similar kinds of ways over time? Uh, or is it that, that this is too conservative? Um, well, you're adding this, you know, you're, you're adding a source of error when you think because you are changing the person. That absolutely. The, the estimating. And not only and changing the relationship, too, of one to a romantic That's um, right. partnership yeah. to one of parent, you know, parental authority, right. the, forgetting that you are changing the people. Yeah. We're, 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 we're changing a lot in that. We're even changing a little bit the form of the measure. <clears throat> but... <clears throat> For self-report using exactly the same measure, the zero-order association between these two things in other studies is about 0.4. The zero-order association here is 0.27. So it really doesn't drop as much as you might think. Okay, let's go on, uh, let's go on and look at G3. So again, the first thing we're going to want to be concerned with is how well does this portion of the model replicate with that portion of the model for G2 during adolescence. <clears throat> Here again, factor loadings, they're all significant, they're all in the right direction. Uh, associations, interestingly, once again, you'll notice that G3 conscientiousness is positively related to all of the antecedent variables in the model, even to, to uh, G1 material investments significantly predict G3 conscientiousness. And G1 parenting investments significantly predict G3 conscientiousness. <clears throat> so there's a lot of continuity across generations in these families. And here's the, uh, the final model. So we 
get the significant relationship from G2 education to G2 income as we did before. G2 income predicts material investments. Education predicts material investments. And material investments predicts G3 conscientiousness. Now, unlike the prior model, G2 income did not predict G2 parenting investments. Education did, but this is, uh, this is significant at the 0 .05, uh, 0 0.05 level only with direction predicted. Now, we predicted direction, so I think it's fair, but, uh, but my colleagues say it's too loose. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it is positive, it's significant. 0 0.05 with direction predicted and parenting investments predict G3 conscientiousness. Now, <clears throat> notice though that G1 parenting investments predict G2 parenting investments more strongly, 0.37 standardized regression coefficient, than G2 education in 2003. Um, I think that's fascinating because all of the studies that we do of parent-child relationships omit what happened in the history of the parents that we're looking at. We just don't have this kind of prospective longitudinal data. And yet if we can take that into account, it's having a major impact, a very significant impact. We're still, in my mind, we're still getting a significant pathway here. It's very much attenuated uh, compared to the model where we don't have that early or information about the history of the child, the history of G2 uh, as an adolescent. Uh, we don't get a similar, we don't, don't get a similar direct path from G1 material investments to G2 material investments. <clears throat> and I think in a way that makes sense because you can't, you can't provide a higher standard of living uh, here no matter what happened to you here unless you have the income to do it. So current income should really have a, a bigger impact on material investments than the earlier material investments of the, uh, uh, in, the, in the last generation of families. <clears throat> okay, so all this makes sense. That's significant, that's significant. Now the, this path I think is really interesting. Now we are getting a significant relationship between adolescent conscientiousness in 1994, predicting out a minimum of 13 years to G3 conscientiousness in 2007 or 2010, and or 2010. 0.26. Uh, so even though we've changed the measures, we've changed the informants, we're still getting a significant path, which leads me to wonder about, well, maybe that last path we saw in the last model wasn't so severely attenuated as we thought it might be by changes in measurement. My, my genetics colleague, Mike Stallings, tells me that that is exactly what you would expect based on twin studies in terms of the genetic inheritance from one parent to a child. He said it's exactly consistent with a genetic effect. It could also be that this parent, this person is conscientious as an adolescent, they're conscientious as an adult, and G3 is learning about conscientiousness from modeling by the parent, as well as it possibly being a genetic effect. It could be either, it could be both. It's more likely it's both. Um, <clears throat> but in my mind, the important thing is we see a reasonably good replication of the same series of, uh, of relationships. Education, income, uh, influencing the kinds of parenting investments that increase the likelihood of uh, uh, con the development of conscientiousness by the next generation child. So we've got it over two generations in the same families. Yes, okay. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Okay, so general support for the interactionist model of cumulative advantage now. If your parents are higher in education, higher in income, they're more likely to invest in a child in ways that promote a personality trait, conscientiousness, that is associated with perseverance, associated with self-control, 
associated with setting standards, having ambitions, and so on and so forth. Those ambitions, in turn, promote future socioeconomic success for the child, and that either feeds back to increase conscientiousness by the adolescent when they become an adult, or it goes on to influence uh, their children uh, through those socioeconomic advantages. Uh, so the findings are consistent with processes of both social causation and social selection. The results are consistent with uh, arguments of, of socialization and genetic effects. And uh, the results indicate that adolescent conscientiousness contributes in important ways to adult SES in a fashion that affects adult personality development. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of the problems with this current design is it's not a genetically informed research design. It's not a twin study or something like that. Um, so in future research, it would be good to have genetic information. It would be nice, and I hope NIH will fund one, a twin study or an adoption study or something like that that will over time include multiple generations. I wouldn't hold my breath because they just hate funding studies for that long a period of time but it would be a good thing to do. But there are possible uh, uh, genetic main and interaction effects in all these processes, and there's the potential importance of epigenetic processes. SES, these SES and parenting factors may, uh, may have epigenetic influences that affect the ways genes are expressed across time. Now, we, do, we did get some money from NIH to, to collect DNA from these families, and, and we do, we are working with those data right now. But I can tell you the genetic effects so far in interaction with aspects of this model are not, uh, are not powerful at all. But we've just begun that process. And we'll know more about potential uh, gene by environment interactions or, or genetic effects. We'll know more about that uh, in the next, in the coming years. <clears throat> Obviously, replication with other samples is needed, including with more diverse populations. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that this work will generalize to more diverse populations, though, because our earlier research on socioeconomic influences, primarily involving stress processes, has replicated from the rural white families in Iowa. It's replicated with African-American families in both urban and rural settings. It's replicated with Mexican-American families. And uh, it's also replicated in other countries. So I'm, I'm, I think these are human beings and the, that the, the effects are going to be similar in lots of other populations. Uh, so SES family processes and adult personality are outcomes from prior phases of development. Part of the stickiness that we see in, um, in SES across time may well be a result of the family, of the related family processes and the related uh, aspects of personality development. Preventive interventions uh, could, should target the early development of positive character attributes. So, you know, whether you're talking about improving the SES of parents, if they're in economic uh, bad straits, whether you're talking about improving parenting practices, or whether through schools or counseling or other kinds of things, you're providing the kinds of <clears throat> warmth, support, and other positive uh, aspects of, a, of, a, of an adult environment for children. All of those things could be potential uh, areas for preventive interventions. And, um, and if you can do things that would increase child and adolescent traits, such as conscientiousness, you should have a positive impact on their ability to do better financially, to do better in terms of educational attainment. Uh, and those things, in turn, may help them to become a more, uh, a more effective parent themselves uh, when they grow to adulthood uh, and uh, have those kinds of responsibilities. So with that, I'll take questions. And <laughs>